Hey gang, and welcome back for another video here on Jochem. Okay gang, so I know we're entrenched in this world of carbonyls, ketones and aldehydes, and all these new reactions that we can do with them. But, uh, I wish I could say things were getting simpler, but I'm about to throw another one at you, and maybe you've already seen it. But in, So in this video, we're gonna be talking about the Wolf-Kishner reaction. And to be honest, nerdily, this is a very favorite mechanism of mine. I remember when I was sitting in 152 Chevron at the University of Pittsburgh and my teacher dropped this knowledge on me. I feel like this was like a budding, nerdy, organic moment for me because I saw the mechanism, jaw hit the floor because I thought it was so cool. I hope you think it's just as cool. So, in looking at this reaction, what does it do for us? So, it's a reduction. And remember, in organic chemistry, oxidation literally means more bonds to oxygen. So if we're reducing, that means we're going to take a carbon that has bonds to oxygen and we're going to make fewer bonds to oxygen on that carbon. So if you look up here, just taking a very, and I'm gonna show you this mechanistically, if you just take a three carbon uh, carbonyl that we have here, a ketone, this happens to be aldehyde, or sorry, well, acetone. So in the first step, what you can expect to see is H2 and NH2, or you'll see it written uh, N2H4, you know, if, if it's not drawn like that. This is hydrazine, okay? This is the star of the show, and luckily what you don't, may not know is this first step is just imine formation. You already know half this mechanism. The second part is not that much longer, and it'll show you how we actually, you know, remove nitrogen from any trace in this reaction. Because you can see we just start with a ketone or an aldehyde and we end with nothing. And it's important to note, this only works with ketones and aldehydes. And I'll even highlight that further. After we do the mechanism, I'm gonna show a couple examples of this reaction in kind of a complete reaction setting. Okay, so how does this mechanism proceed? Luckily, the first part, like I mentioned, it's just amine formation. So you can see we have this amine and we have an acidic environment. So just like we have been doing. First step is protonate the carbonyl oxygen. We need to activate our carbonyl. So I'm gonna bring in hydronium. I'm going to activate this carbonyl carbon. And I hope, I know I've failed to do this in some of my past videos, but these arrows are really, you know, back and forth up until a certain point, right? So we protonate the carbonyl oxygen. At this point, we bring in the amine. We've now activated that carbonyl carbon. We've made it more reactive. So we will now attack the carbonyl carbon, kick electrons up on that carbonyl oxygen. So at this point, right, we're going to form what we will later know to be a tetrahedral intermediate. We're gonna form an intermediate, right? And at this point, we have a lot of things going on in H2. We have a plus charge on the nitrogen, neutral on the OH. Remember with imine formation, or at, you know, at this point, right, we know since we're forming an imine, we want this to stay and we want this to leave. So we need to make this a better leaving group. We need to make this less of a good leaving group. So this is our proton shuffle step, right? We're gonna protonate what we want to keep and we're gonna deprotonate what we want to stay. So I'll bring back hydronium. That marker is dying on me. Let me switch to blue. So I'm gonna bring in hydronium. I'm gonna have this OH grab H plus. And then I'm gonna have another water come by and deprotonate the nitrogen. Again, I want that to stick around. So again, back and forth there. I'm gonna do my work over here now. So now we have OH2 plus, right? We have water, we have a good leaving group. Before it was just hydroxide, now it's water. Certainly something stable, good to kick off. And now we have a neutral nitrogen over here. So remember, this is when we kick off water and it's that irreversible step in our imine formation mechanism. Swing electrons down, form a double bond, and we're going to eject water. So that's that forward arrow minus H2O step. You don't have to write minus H2O, but I'm doing it for completeness. Okay? It's at this point, then we have this right here, Na, uh, the NH2, the hydrogen, a plus charge on nitrogen, and if this was imine formation, our final step would be to clean this up, to deprotonate that nitrogen because it's not a giant fan of that positive charge, right? So this would, would be the end for imine formation. However, this isn't just imine formation. This is the Wolf-Kishner reaction. So 
at this point in time, right? I would say this is end step one, if you will. And I, that purple marker is just not doing it. That's the end of the first step. Now, what do, how do we you know, proceed? I hope you can see we shift from an acidic environment to a basic environment. So at this point, we no longer have H plus floating around. All we have is hydroxide and water. So what I wanna show you, and some of these steps you may have be seen consolidated into one. I'm gonna show you them individually, but what will first happen is hydroxide comes along and deprotonates the nitrogen that's not part of the double bond. What that does, you'll see, creates a negative charge on this nitrogen. And then what can happen is the following. This, these electrons swing over, you form a nitrogen, nitrogen double bond. And then we will break the octet rule with this nitrogen because there's a lone pair we, you don't see pictured. What we can do is you can bounce electrons onto this carbon right here, forming a carbanion, and that's okay. And, this, and that's a step you might see consolidated because what happens is after you do that, and I'm nervous, I'm gonna run out of space, but um, I don't have the double bond anymore. Sorry, gang. We have carbon ion, we have a nitrogen with the double bond right there. We have this going on. This will just pick up water, or sorry, this will pick up a proton from water. So that negative charge on the carbon does not stick around. It's kind of a temporary gig, okay? So you can see that's where we get a hydrogen on this carbon and that's where one of these hydrogens and you'll see the other one comes from as well. So now we have this going on and all we're gonna do is just repeat this. Hydroxide comes along again, deprotonates that nitrogen. We put electrons on there, we form a negative charge on the nitrogen, it has two lone pairs, negative charge. We're gonna do exactly what we did again. We swing this in and we form a triple bond. Now, you may not have thought about nitrogen gas in a while, but it's a super stable, inert gas. It makes up a lot of our atmosphere, but it's nitrogen with a triple bond and then a lone pair on each nitrogen. I hope you're seeing that's what we just formed. Nature loves stability. Nature loves creating things that are stable and low energy. And that's exactly what nature just did and does in the Wolf-Kishner reaction. So once you form this, we know these electrons get booted onto the carbon, but I hope you understand the magnitude of what just happened. We just created nitrogen gas that leaves our system and that carbon nitrogen bond is gone now. So at this point, you then just have a carbon ion right here that quickly snatches up a proton from water and then you have your Wolf-Kishner product. So to quickly review, I know there's a lot of steps, but some of them you can consolidate into one if you'd like. So this is imine formation, right? Up till here, you already knew how to do this before watching this video. From there on, you just had to deprotonate this nitrogen, create a negative charge on this, form a nitrogen-nitrogen bond, and then bump electrons onto a carbon. Then you just quench that negative charge by grabbing a proton from water. That's our available source of H+. Water, right? And then just do it again, and then you see you have nitrogen gas that is being, you know, that is uh, created and leaves our system, and then you end up with a reduction, right? You wipe away the C double bonded O, you get this, and this is a great reaction to use on ketones and aldehydes, and does not affect double bonds. Okay, gang. So that's the mechanism. I hope you thought it was as cool as I do. Uh, but I want to show you some complete the reaction examples and then close the book on the Wolf-Kishner reaction. So give me one second while I wipe that up. Okay, gang, to round out this Wolf-Kishner video, I want to look at two complete the reaction examples. So if we take a look right up here, right, you'll see we have a carbonyl, a ketone, right? Remember this Wolf-Kishner is for ketones and aldehydes. And you can see this is a Wolf-Kishner because you will see hydrazine. Now, of course, I'm showing it to you a little differently. Now I'm showing it to you in that format, the N2H4, right? As opposed to where we saw in the first, you know, the mechanistic part of the video where it was H2NNH2, kind of outlining what it actually looks like in its skeletal Lewis dot structure. So we can see this is basically showing us imine formation. And then this is that part where we deprotonate, deprotonate, and then 
drive off nitrogen gas. So why I wanted to show you this example is because the Wolf Kishner is only going to reduce your carbonyls. Remember, um, we've seen, you know, in the benzene stuff, you know, we can use hydrogenation and stuff like that for carbonyls. Of course, that does not apply here, but this is a nice way to completely eliminate your carbonyls without touching alkene functional groups, right? Double bonds. So this will only reduce the carbonyl, interact with the carbonyl, and I'm only drawing these hydrogens for completeness, but this, you know, the Wolf Kishner, a powerful thing about it is that it gives you the ability to wipe carbonyls away, ketones and aldehydes, and not affect double bonds elsewhere in your structures. Okay, I'll erase this. Okay, now down here, and you can, we can assume, assume XS, I'm gonna write XS, but what I wanted to highlight down here is carbonyl function groups that are less reactive than aldehydes and ketones, or not aldehydes and ketones. They are not subjected to Wolf-Kishner reductions. So right here you see we have a ketone, but we also have, and this could be an aldehyde, but we also have an amide. Amides are not as reactive as ketones and aldehydes, so the Wolf-Kishner is only going to operate on this carbonyl functional group and leave this unchanged. So, if you saw something like an ester, that would also be unaffected. So you'll see this carbon is reduced, the carbonyl is gone, clean wiped away, the amide untouched. Okay gang, thank you for coming and learning about the Wolf-Kishner reaction with me. I hope you think, really truly think the mechanism is as cool as I do. It was really one of those moments where when I was in college, I was like, dang, Ochem, pretty cool. Thank you for watching this video on Geochem. If you can give it a thumbs up, that'd be awesome. If not, that's okay too. I hope you learned something. But most importantly, I hope to see you all in the next video.